the, one of the thought processes. It might be, you know, some people um, may have trouble communicating with their staff, and so they would have to look back, what is it that I'm not doing well that I could do better to communicate, or, or if they're not getting results, what, are, what objectively could I do better to get better results? So I don't know if that's a good answer. It's kind of a, that's a great question. I don't know if I gave you a good answer or not. Yeah. What I, what I try to do is, uh, the, the question is, when uh, working with other cultures, um, how do I make sure that I'm open to their diversity of thought? And what I always try to do is, if we are clearly disagreeing on something, I try to understand their point of view. And that may not always work, because they have a completely different way of coming at a problem. And so that's, that's when the communication is so important, so that you can say, why, why do you think this? And break it down into manageable chunks on, you know, for this part of the problem, why do you think this? And for this part of the problem, why do you think this? And, I mean, it's real, and it's not easy. You know, we're, uh, we have joint ventures with uh, companies in China, and we come at things much differently. And so we spend a tremendous amount of time just trying to broker those execution plans and how are we going to do things and they would do it much differently than we would and so um, trying to get that common ground that's my job you know versus the actual once we once we can find out what our plan is you know I have to do that then the engineers can work and, and do their work and so it is it's a lot of time just trying to understand what is it I'm not seeing that makes us, them so adamant that they can't do this or can do this or whatever but it takes, uh, it just takes, it takes uh, perseverance, I think, and you have to just not be black and white on anything. There comes a time, sooner or later, you know, once you get deep enough into something where it becomes black and white, where, you know, if, if it's a safety item, for example, we, we will not compromise safety for our cars. And that's one where sooner or later it becomes black and white and it's really important to be able to explain why we're, we would take that stand. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, how, do we, how do we convert from micromanaging into actually handing out responsibilities, I think is kind of your question. And, I, and by handing out responsibilities, the way we're, we're organized, for example, I showed, uh, you know, I've got 13 direct reports, and they may have uh, 1,000 people or 1,500 people working for them, and so they have direct reports where they may have 10 people working for them. And it's kind, of, it's kind of a pyramid where you end up, you know, starting with 10 people reporting to one person. And then, so you kind of visualize that. But fundamentally, what you have to do is get to the point where each one of your direct reports, you've learned their strengths and weaknesses, what their expertises are. And I know each one of my staff, what they're strong in, and I don't have to worry about that. Uh, for example, I have uh, electrical architecture, so all of our electrical systems, infotainment systems, and the guy running that is the best in the industry. I don't have to worry about that stuff at all. But he also has um, the electrical systems group that ties into things like autonomous, and um, we have something called super cruise where it's, it's semi-autonomous. And so we have to, I have to make sure his vehicle knowledge, the overall vehicle capability, 
Uh, I keep an eye on that with him because that's my expertise. And so it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a check and balance where people have clear expertise, they know what they're doing, you just let them go. And the only time you really need, you know, just ask them what they need for help. And then there are others that they may be venturing into something they haven't done before, they need help, and I'll spend a lot of time with them. And so then when you think about the structure all the way down, that's if we're operating well, everyone does that the same way. Other questions? Yeah. So you talked a little bit earlier about learning from uh, leaders who have been really good. You learned about yourself on one that you learned from skilled and incredibly. How did you sort of ultimately learn from those extraordinary, even though they haven't shined in the way that you shine in the organization? So the question is, how did I, how did I, um, behave when I had a boss that was on the bad side of the scale, basically. And I can think of a specific example. I was, um, I had a, it was my, actually my boss's boss, so he was two layers above me, but it was, I was early in my career and we really kind of didn't see eye to eye. And in, in that case, what I did is I threw myself into my job and that was really when I realized in my career that if you worry too much about what people, um, like what your next job is going to be and worried about your next promotion or something, you can just get slammed down by one person that is in your chain of command that's going to decide that you're not going to move anywhere. And so I was, that was the longest period of my career where I was at one level. We have different levels inside of GM. And so what I, what I decided to do was I'm going to learn uh, as much as I possibly can about the vehicle evaluation, the vehicle development, and he can't take that away from me. You know, I, I'm basically learning an expertise, and it was kind of selfless in that I was just trying to make the car better, trying to do the job as good as I could, and people surrounding him would see what was going on and independent of him, it, it kind of helped me through that part of my career. And so I think, I guess the nugget of advice is you're, sooner or later you're going to run into somebody that you just don't see eye to eye with and you may not respect them because you see they have integrity issues or you may think they're out only for themselves and not for the team. And what you, what you can't do is fall into being a more negative acting because you're frustrated with that particular person. You've got to stay true to yourself, true to what you're trying to accomplish, and you know, just keep plowing through that. Because it will, you're not going to have one boss your entire, entire career. So sooner or later, something's going to change. You just got to be prepared for it. That's, that's the way I, I did that one. The other one is, um, I, I have a, in my mind, there was a particular guy who was, uh, he was actually a vice president, and he really was terrible to people. And, you know, we'd be in a group like this, and he would um, really unleash on somebody and tell them, you know, how bad their design was or how bad their activity was. And um, so, you know, I was working uh, in his sphere, and I would try to make sure everybody understood that's not okay and make sure that the people I was working with, I would use as an example to say, if you really have uh, feedback for somebody, if it's positive, do it in front of everybody. But if it's constructive, do it in a closed room so that you can have an open and honest conversation without someone shutting down and being defensive immediately. Because that's what happens. I mean, if you get embarrassed in front of all of your peers, you don't care what that person says at that point. You're, you're kind of checked out. So that's... That's one of the things, you know, you learn and, and try to apply and try to make sure the, the people that you can have influence on sees that is not the right way to do things. Any other questions? Yep. I, 
I, the, the question is how important are mentors uh, early in the career? And I use them a lot just because as in any form of life or any part of life, there are different levels of maturity. And so the maturity inside the work world, I think, is driven by experiences and uh, things that they've had to deal with. And so if, if they're already far along in their career and they're doing things like you would like to do someday, um, I would ask them, you know, what, what, how did you get where you are? Or just what kind of things did you concentrate on? And ask what, what is it that uh, if I want to get to be in this job, what kind of things do I need to do? And I think I would also suggest that you need more than just one person that's giving you that kind of advice because if there are three people, even if they're very similar in what their backgrounds are, they, they'll probably give you three different types of advice. And so it's up to you to take that in and decide how do I want to how do I want to act on this? And I think in the end, you are in control of your own destiny, you know, in terms of, of how you want to go through your career. But having people's perspective that have been there and already kind of done some of those things. And you can ask people, it doesn't have to be, you know, three layers above you. You can ask people that are on the same level as you, but you respect and, you know, get feedback from them on how would they go about something. Um, it, it's the other thing I would tell you that's really important that this sounds so obvious, but it's, you would not believe how few times this happens. If you know what you want to do, tell somebody. Because sometimes I think, and I was like this, I assume, well, somebody's going to look out and tell, you know, figure out I should go do this. But there's normally so much competition that unless you've let someone know, you know, I would really like to do this, they're not even going to have their eye out for you. And so you, if you have real ideas about what you want to do in your career, tell somebody. You know, tell either your direct manager or, um, uh, most importantly, tell your direct manager. But if you if you talk to other people in the company as well. Other questions? Yep. Um, this is kind of a specific question. So I imagine as you moved up in leadership roles, you started overseeing things that you didn't have as in depth knowledge. Right. So my question is, how much do you need to know to be an effective leader over those? So the question is, as you move up and you're managing areas that you're not expert in, how do you learn it, basically, I think. And that's exactly where I'm at right now, because I have, um, uh, again, one of the things you probably didn't see, I've got connected ecosystems that involves uh, how, we, how our cars and OnStar deal with cell phone companies and back offices. And I'm a mechanical engineer that works on cars, and so that is way outside of my expertise. And so I've also got electrical systems, engineering, and um, architecture, cybersecurity, all of those things that are just outside of what I really know. And so what I've recognized is that in those cases, you really got to trust the people that are in those roles that are working for you. And you've got to try, what I try to do at least is, I don't try to study it all in like one night and learn it all. I try to, by osmosis a little bit, just learn. And I try to write down the key things that are critical in that particular area. And the other thing I've been doing this year is I've had um, each one of my direct reports come and we sit down and I interview them. And I say, so what's the, what are the five things that I absolutely should know about your business? Because for example, one of, the, one of my organizations is responsible for the strategy for fuel economy and CAFE, corporate average fuel economy. And there are, it, it's one of the most complicated things you've ever seen in your life. It's worse than differential equations. But the, um, I asked Charlie Klein, who has that job, what are the five things that are no-brainers I should know about this area? 
And so being proactive and let them tell you, here's the, here's the stuff you've got to know, like the Cliff Notes version. Here's the Cliff Notes version, and then just trying to soak in more and more over time. Recognize you're never going to be an expert in those areas because you pay people to be experts. But what you've got to be knowledgeable enough about is how to connect the dots. And so for me, connecting the dots on corporate average fuel economy and how we're tuning our cars for rolling resistance on the tires versus handling. And I, gotta be, I need to be able to connect those dots. I don't have to be an expert in those areas, but I need to go, Charlie, have you talked to Wayne about this? You know, so that's, it is one of the scariest things when you're, I feel like I am surrounded by people way smarter than me every day. And so that, that's one of the things you kind of got to get used to. Any other questions? The core, by the way, th to have a level of expertise in something is important because otherwise you do feel like, what am I bringing to the party? And so what I bring to the party is total vehicle execution. And so I feel that confidence just because I can look anybody in the world and I know I'm good at that. If you don't have something that you've learned that core expertise in, I think it'll eat away at, at your confidence. So the question is, how do you build relationships globally uh, when you're remote? And so the, the first answer is, honestly, seeing someone face to face and having a meal with them, having a beer with them, or, or uh, somehow getting a common understanding face to face just around something. Even if you find out, hey, you like basketball, I like basketball. You know, and, and so forming a relationship. That's not always possible, you know, a lot of times you have to work for a year before you ever meet someone face to face. And so that's more challenging. But some of those same things apply where you want to try to find common ground on what is it that you might like, you know, inside work or outside work or just forming something. So uh, we use terms, um, uh, what's that, uh, Stephen Coveney? So that Stephen Coveney wrote a book called Speed of Trust. And so how much more effective you are when you trust someone that you work with. Because when they say, you know, the sky is blue, you trust them and you go, okay, the sky is blue. Versus someone that you've never worked with before, they'll say the sky is blue. And you think, why are they saying that? What, what could they benefit from saying that? You know, and, and what, what is their agenda? And so our CEO, Mary Barr, also says, you know, um, form relationships before the relationship is needed. Meaning, get to know someone before you really have to ask for a favor. And so I, I would say the short answer is, as you're working with teams and if you're working uh, remotely, try to establish that rapport with them in some way so that you know you're, you're trying to work together to uh, a common goal. And, but ideally, Clear, we have, uh, we don't do them as much anymore, but we used to have face-to-faces where we'd travel to whatever region and we'd spend time together because that, that is invaluable. If you can do it, do it. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for the time. Uh, hopefully this was somewhat beneficial. And hopefully my goal was for when you think about today, one thing will be in your head. So like, because I, I still think about 28 years ago, some things, you know, there were people that had come in from NASA and different companies, and I still think about little tidbits they threw out. And um, you're going to a great university, you have great futures ahead of you, and just um, enjoy it. Sometimes it's going to be stressful, sometimes it's going to be hard, but I think the we're in a golden age for technology, and you're going to be, at least when I look at the automotive industry, we're going to completely change over the next 20 years, like grossly change on, on what happens. And so probably just about whatever endeavor you're going to go into, you're going to see the same type of uh, technical advancement. So enjoy it, and uh, I guess I'll turn it back to you.
Sure. Sure. All right. Yeah. Uh, just to keep up on your machine, so you're working in a retirement. Don't do it all for that. So you got to get it. 